Okay, uh, hi everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming out for Earth Day today. Um, when, they, uh, when they asked me to do this talk, first they asked me to talk about um, uh, regional uh, uh, plants and animals that were threatened and you know what the status of those creatures were, things like Mexican gray wolves and uh, western spotted owls and some of our fish. Uh, but then uh, somehow that got switched to providing a more global perspective. Uh, where we are globally in terms of biodiversity loss. Uh, can everybody hear me? It's pretty windy, isn't it? Okay, so uh, what I wanted to do today, and you know, it's a hard thing to do on Earth Day because we're all here to celebrate the Earth, right? But at the same time, I think it's really important that we have a realistic understanding of where we are at in time and what we can do uh, as we move forward, okay? Uh, and before I started, I wanted to introduce these three students from Elder Leopold Charter School. Uh, they're seniors, and uh, with me, <laughs> this is Aiden Young, Emily Cox, and Isabella Chase. And uh, they were kind enough to travel with me uh, all the way to Atlanta, Georgia recently uh, uh, to attend a Climate Reality Project Climate Leadership Corps training with Vice President Al Gore. And so it was an incredible experience for them and they've come back to the community now uh, really to try to uh, uh, bring a youth perspective to our climate crisis and our diversity crisis. And I think we're going to be hearing a lot more of them and we're going to be seeing them out here uh, protesting uh, you know on Fridays for quite a while now so uh, so I also have been super busy lately and this topic is a pretty weighty topic I mean it's uh, it's got some real you know uh, weight to it so uh, I wrote it out and you know it's still in my little chicken scratch here uh, and so I'm going to try to piece it together as uh, best I can but I didn't want to leave the ideas out because I wanted it to be a, something coherent that you could take home with you. So if I'm, you know, a little choppy, give me a break. <laughs> okay, so um, 30 years ago, uh, when I was a graduate student at Indiana University. Ooh, yeah, woo! yeah, woo! Where are you really? I was at School of Public and Environmental right. Affairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, SPIA. And uh, uh, Bill McKibben's book, The End of Nature, had just come out. And it was the first, you know, non-scientist uh, exploration of the issue of clim climate change. And it really kind of rocked my world. And right then and there, I think, is when the Anthropocene started for me. You know, that's our new geological epoch that uh, scientists say that we're in now. And I think it was right then and there also that I had this sort of strange kind of certainty um, that my hometown hero, Roger Tory Peterson, he's from Jamestown, the 20th century's most famous birder, uh, he was talking at a local Audubon and somebody asked him the, the question straight out, where are we at really, where, where we're at? And he uh, was pretty old then and had seen a lot of things and he said, well, you know when the, the glass is in the sink and the water just starts to go over the edge and it's sort of like an exponential trip downward to the bottom of the sink? That's where he felt that we were at 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, and uh, let's see. So it was at that moment that I think that I began to really understand that a critical threshold had been crossed. And we were committing ourselves to an increasingly uncertain future uh, and an ecological bottleneck really at a global scale. And so I remember thinking back then uh, that my concept of mother nature was shifting was changing and she no longer felt maternal anymore, uh, infinitely forgiving. That was no longer true. And uh, it's felt more like a partnership now, almost an adult relationship. And like all such relationships, it only works in the long run, you know, when both partners are happy. And uh, usually that has something to do with respect. So, uh, you know, here we are, we're entering into the Earth's six mass extinction event in as big a hurry as we can and it's our species fault and it's a tragedy really beyond comprehension uh, and uh, it's the same thing that Rachel Carson uh, saw when she wrote a long time ago uh, no witchcraft no enemy action had silenced the rebirth of new life in the stricken world the people had done it themselves it's pretty powerful words 
Uh, and so now, you know, if you're watching David Attenborough's new program, we have walruses plunging off cliffs uh, because we have become a geophysical force at a planetary scale. And so far, we can't seem to see the responsibility that comes with that kind of power. Uh, there's a whole new ethic that comes along with that, that we have hardly yet even explored. Uh, for those of you that might not be familiar with the science, uh, the past 10,000 years is referred to commonly as the Holocene Epoch. And it was what Pope Francis recently called uh, you know, a miraculous period of climatic stability, with global average surface temperatures varying only one degree plus or minus Celsius in that whole 10,000 year period. That's what allowed human civilization to develop in the first place. We already knew how to plant seeds. Uh, it just didn't make any sense until the climate was stable. Uh, and that remarkable stability, it was locked in because of life. Uh, the great biomes of our world, you know, the tropical forests, the tundras, the coral reefs, uh, the great north woods, they're the ones that set the thermostat on Earth. They're the ones that controlled very finely carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And so we're rapidly leaving that world behind. So we're gathered here today on Earth Day to celebrate the Earth, uh, to show some respect. Uh, but it's a hard thing to do when you see what's going on. Uh, we've almost certainly just recently lost the coral reefs. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, bleaching events caused by blobs of hot ocean water that drift like, you know, polygons of destruction over our reef systems are happening too frequently now for the corals to successfully recover. You know, the Great Barrier, the Great Barrier Reef, one of the you know, miracles of life on Earth, there almost certainly is going to die now. Uh, it, it's the food resource for over one and a half billion people, the coral reefs of the world. Uh, and the Arctic is in utter chaos. Uh, rapid warming is causing profound changes in almost all Arctic systems. Uh, and what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Uh, 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 the poles were the refrigerators of the world. And uh, it's a new planet uh, now. And so this is a moral issue, and it's a constitutional issue. We are in incredible times. The decisions we make and the actions we take over the next 10 years will determine what kind of planet we will have for the next 10,000. That's just incredible. And so this is also a moment of reflection, a reminder that uh, you know the religious impulse, what it is really, uh, is our species understanding that we're able to decipher the difference between what's good and what's wrong and to acknowledge the need in times like this uh, to find a more larger, more comprehensive version of ourselves. So, you know, geocide or ecocide, whatever you want to call it, it's a crime, uh, both against humanity and the rest of the living world. We are losing whole ecosystems, whole biomes are threatened. We are forced now by the politics of scarcity uh, to recognize that the, the prospect that future generations, our children and their children, will find themselves lost and lonely and alien in a hostile world. Uh, you know, the oldest living constitution on Earth, does anybody know what it is? It's the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, the oldest living constitution is called the Iroquois Great Law of Peace, and it's over 800 years old, we think. We're not, we don't know for sure because they didn't write it down. It just started showing up on wampum belts. Anyways, it is anchored in their obligation to the seventh generation. Uh, in this country, uh, we're just about to have that constitutional argument. Uh, we're going to decide very soon if we're going to extend human rights towards future generations. We're going to be deciding here very soon if government of the people, by the people, and for the people is a constitutionally obligated uh, uh, necessity for the common good, with intergenerational equity really as our guiding light, light like it is for the Iroquois. Um, thankfully, we are pretty complex creatures. Uh, 
Uh, we're not fixed at some point on the ecological continuum, like a beaver or a bullfrog. Uh, we get to choose who we are. Uh, and uh, I'm always moved by, again, Roger Tory Peterson back home at the Audubon Center. They have a rock with a plaque to him on it. And it's one of his quotes, and it says, we alone of all creatures have it within our power to ravage the world or make it a garden. Um, uh, so, Earth Day, uh, you know, so there's a lot still to celebrate. Uh, and so be of good cheer. You know, I think we're about to witness for ourselves one of the most important and interesting events in all of human history. Uh, one big benefit of running out of time is that you no longer have a choice. Now we have to act. Uh, I remember back in graduate school, again, being alarmed by the implications of the coming Anthropocene. I met with Dr. Caldwell. Uh, he was the school's founder, and he was also uh, the intellectual architect of NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, our granddaddy environmental uh, law. Uh, and uh, he was pretty old now, and I was in his office. He was mostly retired, and I asked him again, point blank, just like those people did at the Audubon Center with Dr. Peterson, I asked him where we were at. You know, I wanted to know the truth. I wanted to know what to do. And uh, he almost perfectly echoed Dr. Peterson. He said that the water, you know, was, he gave pretty much that same metaphor. And so I think it even cemented more in my mind the idea that I had to find some way to help in this situation. And so I asked him what I could do. You know what he said? He said, study restoration ecology because it's the only kind of ecology we have now. I was like, whoa, that's a pretty profound statement. Uh, and so sharpen your teeth, folks, uh, because like a beaver, we're a keystone species now. We're forced by circumstance to restore the earth. Uh, as climate change advances and we start spinning down the, next, down the extinction vortex, uh, just never lose hold of hope. Uh, that's my advice, I think, because physical thresholds and social thresholds are so intimately connected. Uh, you know, our young people are changing the world right now. Uh, they're going into survival mode, essentially. And, you know, uh, changes again to these physical systems are forcing us to really look at the concept of intergenerational equity. Um, so what does that mean sitting here, you know, on Earth Day? You know, are we sitting here in hospice, you know, or are we sitting here to, you know, restore our commitment to do what it will take to create a living world in the future? And uh, for me, I guess, uh, I've, I've settled into a strategy uh, reflected in the Upper Gila Watershed Alliances, if you guys all know them, they're one of the organizations here. Uh, they have a new project called Thinking on the Mountain that I'm involved with. And uh, that project uh, focuses on ecological literacy uh, and youth empowerment. And uh, by supporting youth field ecology, uh, especially at schools like Edo Leopold that have this experiential education component where we're able to actually take kids out into the woods consistently every Friday. These guys are all eco-monitors on that crew. It's been, a, it's been wonderful. I've done it for two semesters now. Uh, you know, we're able to use nature as their primary teacher. And that is a lot, that is the way that you get ecological concepts embedded into your brain in a hurry. And that's the goal, this has to happen in a hurry. So we're here to really improve the, the efficiency of ecological literacy acquisition in our community. Uh, but then, you know, of course, being out in it, uh, a lot of the students just fall in love with the natural world and, you know, that's as it should be. And, um, and so the climate advocacy and the environmental justice component of thinking on the mountain is just the expression of that new felt, you know, love and concern and commitment. Uh, but the other part of youth empowerment demands that we find ways to have their now educated voices heard. And so that's, that's what all the posters are about over there. And that's what we're doing. Uh, so uh, I guess we're just sort of joining the progressive parade of fusion politics 
you know, towards a better outcome. Uh, it's not left and it's not right, it's out in front. And uh, what we all have in common here uh, in Silver City, I think, uh, you know, is what Aldo Leopold referred to as our land community. Uh, the mountains and the wilderness and, you know, the blessed Gila River, which is still flowing free, you know. Uh, and nobody wants to lose those things, to have them go away. Uh, so we're trying to keep our chins up and celebrate Earth Day because the greatest show on Earth is just about to begin. Uh, by astronomical luck, uh, we, the living generations of today, are present at most, one of the most profound points in human history. We creatures of now will decide if a sapient ape, you know, seemingly more tool maker than wise men, was such a good evolutionary idea after all. Uh, it's a great story, and we're the ones that get to write it. Uh, but it's going to take a lot of action. Uh, and it's going to take uh, uh, a lot of action locally, uh, everywhere around the world. Uh, but here in our region, I think I want to just mention a couple things that I wanted to have on your horizon. One is that we have to make sure uh, that when our draft forest plan comes out, uh, in this fall, I believe, we have to make sure that it realistically has identified the climate crisis and the biological diversity crisis as crises. Uh, and uh, uh, we need them to really act to make sure that the plan is focused on, you know, resilience, restoration, and recovery. Uh, because, you know, if you've been watching Greta Thunberg, you know, on the internet or on TV, we are in the danger zone. She is right. The house is on fire. Uh, and your formal comments on that Gila draft plan in support of actions that support restoration, resiliency, and recovery are going to be super important. Uh, and we need to support these kids uh, in really any way we can. Uh, come out and protest us with us, like I said, on Fridays. Uh, and pretty soon, they're going to be giving climate reality leadership talks all over town. Audubon Society, Native Plant Society, we're going to speak at the Forest Service. We just did a radio show, so hopefully their voices are going to become well known to you. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you want to support us monetarily, that would be great. We need art supplies and field uh, equipment. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in the summertime, we want to be able to do bio blitzes where we take the kids into the wilderness and spend a week uh, really understanding and getting baseline information on the diversity that's still there right now so we can have that as we move forward. Uh, so, of course, we need to act. Well, let me just say also about, you know, uh, over the last two years, we've been raising the issue of the feral cattle that occur on the main stem of the Gila River in the Gila wilderness. It's an absolute fiasco. It's been happening for three decades now, and those cows are... Um, are uh, breeding, they're up to about 150 animals, and they're preventing the recovery of our wilderness river. Those cows have to go. And if, whenever you have any contact with the Forest Service or feel like writing a letter to the editor, you let them know that the first wilderness in the world is not the place for feral cows, especially on our riparian corridor. Uh, so of course we need to act, but we need to reflect too, and Earth Day again is the perfect day for that. Uh, you know, after climbing uh, Mount Katahdin uh, many, many years ago, Henry Thoreau went back and, ho and wrote, uh, who are we, where are we? Uh, those are pretty big questions, and we still don't really know. Uh, but now is a moment in time where more importantly than ever before, we have to ask, when are we? When are we? We know now that we're in an unprecedented period of change. It's a time of crisis and loss, but change, even planetary scale change, happens. The Buddha was right. Change is inherent in all things. Strive on with diligence. And that's what I intend to do. So thank you very much. And I'll take any questions.